picker and the tree. And I thought about calling it the picker and the trees because obviously if you look here you see two trees. So this is the tree of life and this is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we'd be looking into some implications and how that applies to how we look at life. Because the picker here is one of the main problems that exist in Christianity. And so the question is, why is this? How can it be that you can read your Bible for hours a day and still possibly get it wrong? This is going to show why. Because if you look at the brain, you have the right brain, and you have a left brain. And then over here you have this concept of being guided by God's Spirit, which all Christians want to do. So, when you look into your left brain, and I meant to put guided by the Spirit. Left brain and right brain, and you're going to have two different ways of being guided. And I'm also, you know, going to look at how we see things in the Bible. See, the right brain is your relational side. And so if you look at the Bible, you'll see 80% of it is stories, and 20% is theology. And sometimes the Christianity, in reverse this, we look at, like, mostly logic and not enough stories. Because what happens is the stories will show you how to live, and the logic kind of shows you why you live. I think that's the healthy way that this is meant to work. If you reverse it, logic shows you how to live, and the stories show you why you live, you're going to have a problem because your right brain doesn't learn by logic, it learns by watching someone else. So like, you know, now that you've learned, you know, plumbing, you know, and how to fix sinks and commodes and many other things, if you show someone else, their right brain learns from you, and then they go and do the same task, they're going to have the same skill that you had, and they may have their own style, but they can learn from you, you know. And that's actually one of the funnest things when you're an adult, to teach younger people the skills that you have, you know. How to do plumbing and fix appliances, how to use high-tech devices, you know. And I enjoy using high-tech devices, so for me, anybody who has a technical challenge, I think, okay, I can show them how this works. And that's fulfilling, you know. So everybody in here, everybody watching this video has gifts that God gave you to share with people. And when you have a place to show your gifts and people say, oh, you gave me something I didn't know, and they feel useful. So that's the right brain. And the left brain is the logic. And so the question is, when God guides you, when God connects to you, which side of your brain is he working with? Any ideas? I hope it's the right. Yes, yes. That's your relational side. Does he work with the left side too? And if so, how would he do that? Through scripture. Yeah, yeah. You read the scripture, you get ideas in your left brain. Or you may get a thought, you know, like I had a thought a couple of days ago when I woke up. And that I can't remember right now, but it was very good. That happens to me a lot, you know. And sometimes like my dad, I'll think, I want to write everything down so I don't miss this thought or that thought. But sometimes, maybe you guys have had this too, yes. you want to just enjoy the stream. Because if you're taking notes in every conversation, yeah, exactly. like when talking to your spouse, they may not like that, you know, after the first five years. They <laughs> just want to talk to you, you know. <laughs> I know somebody who was almost to the point of doing a little bit of that. I won't say who. But uh, when you have God give you ideas, it's really enjoyable when, you know, the water level in your right brain is all the way up, when you're full of joy, you know. I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. <coughs> when this is full of joy, your left brain works very well. In fact, there's a text in the Bible about this, about how your left brain is powered up by your right brain. There's the joy of the Lord being your strength, and obviously you have strength to think, as well as strength to relate to people. But this is the primary one. 
like I said, because you know when this fills up, then it spills over into here. So if only one side of your brain is connecting to God, it's hopefully going to be the right brain, because then you're going to have that relational joy. The Bible is going to make sense. Everything is lit up. If you guys ever had a time where you're reading the Bible and it seems kind of dead and lifeless, like nothing is really coming, there's no inspiration. <coughs> I've had that, and when I go and connect to somebody who I enjoy being with, and then I come back to the Bible again, it always is lit up after that. And that tells me that God was there, but my relational circuits need to be refreshed, you know. It's like priming the pump for a well. You're going to put some water in, pump it, and then the water comes back out. That's how our brains work. So. This picker I'm going to be talking about is related to this tree. So we're going to go here, and this is the <coughs> English word bad, not the Hebrew word bad, just to uh, <laughs> clarify that. And then over here, this is the tree of life. And I'm going to describe a couple examples. and. But how your own brain reacts, you're going to see this is God's preferred method of using us. So like here's some things under bad as far as actions. Immoral. Um, lies. That actually applies to both sides. I'm just going to put an arrow like this. There's lies over here too. Um, bad, um, let's see, trick. But that applies to both sides too. Um, over here, good um, action can be good, but the motivation can be wrong. So when you have the wrong motivation, the issue is that it, it isn't quite a correct action, you see. Because I had this insight just a few months ago, like what makes up a correct action, you know, and what is that? Well, let's see, if I was to do something that was really, really the best that it could be, it could be doing the right action at the right time, with the right motivation, the right attitude, <coughs> And in the right way. So you get all those five things and you think, how much in your life have you been able to do actions that are like that, where all five things are perfectly in sync, you know? Probably not very much, you know? I may not have done one of those in my whole 40 years, you know? But as our brother Michael said yesterday, and this morning, it's so wonderful that our righteousness comes from God, so even though we make mistakes, we are counted as righteous, and He puts us into heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and so even though we make mistakes, it's counted as if we're perfect, you know, and so that's our identity. Um, I think I mentioned that to two people this morning, but the concept that helped me is our identity is righteous and holy, but our condition is fallen, you know. We try to do the right thing and it doesn't work, but we know that I am accepted by God, so the fact that I've had failures doesn't matter so much. And so, this bad side of the tree is basically the bad things that people do. You know, we all agree, you know, lying, cheating, and stealing, those are bad things. This good side of the tree is good things that you do, but with the wrong motivation. Because what's common to both is the flesh. So you could actually call this the tree of the flesh. You know, this whole tree comes from you. Those are things that come from you, your words, your thoughts. Can I say something? Yes. That word flesh in the Greek is sarx. Yes. And in every instance where it appears in the Newer Testament, mm -hmm. it connotes a negative reality. Wow. A sinful condition. Okay. So, what you see here, you know, like to go to the corporate level is, you know, we know people in society who are bad, you know, they're planning to destroy other people, you know, they want to make them sick. But these are people 
who are doing good things. They may really want to bless people, but their hearts aren't right with God. You know, the Bible says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But there's a lot of people who don't experience that, even though they're doing good things. You know, they work with charities, they help the homeless, you know. They seek to always be kind to people. But all of those things can exist on this side of the tree. Because, see, many people relate to this tree as if it was the tree of the knowledge of evil. But it's also the tree of good. So, if you cover those two sides, what is this tree of life? And I'm going to put these words. This is what every human being wants. Everybody wants joy, and everybody wants freedom. And the thing is, how many Christian religions have you seen that are often trying to reduce the joy and reduce the freedom? Me. Not all. Yeah. So the thing is, this is the tree of life. This was the Garden of Eden. This was God's intent for us, which includes joy and freedom. And so, why is it that God is the source of joy and freedom? So many people, in trying to get closer to God, are trying to reduce their joy and their freedom. Or as often happens, to reduce other people's joy and freedom. Why would this be? If you're trying to remove the thing from yourself that God is the source of, in order to approach Him. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Why do you guys think that that has happened so much in history? Because, because man is governed by the flesh. Yes. And the flesh, this is the perfect text for this. Turn to Romans 8, verse 8. And anybody who wants to can read it, as a friend of mine said in a nice, loud, evangelistic voice. I'm sorry, verse 7. Yes. Because, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, yes. it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Yes. Perfect. So let's, okay. Perfect. So what I was going to say here was, look at this piece, the carnal mind, that refers to your thinking, your left brain, is enmity against God. So it's in resistance to God. And the way that I see this is... As long as we're in our fallen state, the ideas that we come up with in our minds aren't always going to be correct. It doesn't mean that, oh, I can't be correct about what I'm thinking. You know, I know that this is chalk, at least. This is the word for chalk in the English language. What is the word for this in Creole, by the way? Cray. Cray? Cray. Cray. It sounds a lot like crayon, actually. Mm -hmm. What's the word for crayon in Creole? Crayon. Crayon. Cool. Because you see, we label things differently, you know, we know what things are, but how does this ability fail in our minds? You know, we have the ability to know what things are, but how would that interfere with our ability to connect to God? What is the thing or the things in us that is broken? Um, Let's go on, it says, for it is not subject to the law of God. So God has this law, it's a way of us living that's meant to bring joy to people. You know, physically healthy, mentally healthy, spiritually healthy, he says his commands are not burdensome. But the mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Well, what does this mean? Is it saying that as long as you trust your own brain, you cannot follow God properly. See, there's two texts that say this. Just listen to these two, just close your eyes, listen to these two texts in order. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. So it's saying here, your mind is rebelling against God, and it cannot submit to God's law. In other words, as long as you're in this world, you're never going to get to a point where everything that God does makes sense to you. You look at the Old Testament, God did many things that make sense to us. And so, 
I'm going to say more on this, I think, in a future day, but when you look at what God does sometimes, I think this doesn't make sense. So I would tend to not trust him. But God says, I see the big picture, even though it looks like I'm not trustworthy because of this, this, and this, I still want you to trust me. And some people try and figure out why God does things, and it gives them some help. But when you realize that the computer that's in everyone's mind is rebelling against God, you're going to realize this computer I cannot trust because it may come up with the wrong answers. And the other text says, lean not on your own understanding. Don't trust your own brain. I said to some people yesterday when I was eight, <coughs> 10 years old, I was in the airport in Amsterdam, and my mother asked me to go down this hallway and check on the price of a hot plate. And I came back and I'd forgotten the price. And I was so upset that I'd forgotten the price. I was depressed for two weeks, and I was crying on the plane for three hours, fearing that I had Alzheimer's at the age of 10, because I forgot <laughs> something. Because I was reading National Geographic about people with Alzheimer's and liver diseases and being attacked by bears, and then swimming pools collapsing, which maybe wasn't the best reading material at age 10. You know? but. I had this fear, and that was the result. My carnal mind was saying, they had Alzheimer's, maybe I have it too. But it didn't think, they were older, they didn't have a good diet, they were stressed, maybe that's how they got Alzheimer's. And that most people forget things from a very young age, and if you remembered everything until you got to age 10, and that actually means that probably you have a very good mind, you know. But I didn't think about that, because when you're fearful, you can see the glass is half empty instead of half full. So, if this is true, then what does that say you know, about our view of scripture and everything else? There's a text that says, I'm going to go to it here, I can quote it, but I want to read the exact reference. And there's two words, yes. And that text is 2 Peter 1.20. If somebody could please read that, and then verse 21 also. Second Peter, verse, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. For the, prophecy, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the, by the Ruach HaKadosh. Yes. And so you see, not by man's will saying, we're going to decide what God tells us, but these people spoke as the Ruach Kadesh moved upon them, saying, you know, this is something that I see, and I want you to see it too. Now we're going to go over to one other text, and we'll come back to where we were. One second. It would take me a lot longer to present before we had these, because I could look it up so quickly. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not finding this particular text, but here's Romans eight twenty seven. Read Romans eight twenty seven. <clears throat> And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh the intersection, intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Yes. And so what that's telling us is that the God searches the hearts and he knows what is his mind. <coughs> He says, you want something here, and I'm going to see what is best for you. So what God is doing is says, I know my mind. I know your mind, but you don't know my mind. Have you ever had an experience where it was something that wasn't very pleasant, but you realized later on that it was a blessing? Yes. See, that's where you have God's <coughs> mind that sees this much, and your mind that sees this much. And when I realize that my mind doesn't see everything, and that I can't trust it, 
probably took the, the kind of, I was, when I was 14, 15, I was digging more into scripture. But I really had a breakthrough when I was 17. And I really wanted to get close to God because I dropped out of high school and that was a shameful experience for me. Because I thought that I was the most intelligent kid in the school, but I dropped out and I couldn't figure out why. It was because I was stressed. But I said, God, I need to have a plan for my life. So I was reading the chapters at the end of Isaiah, which are very encouraging, you know, I'll enlarge the place of your tent, etc., etc. So, what I was seeing was, is that God saw something I didn't see. I'm just going to quote this text, because sometimes one word is a different word, but it says, no, no man, no one knows this, no one knows the mind of a man, except the spirit of that man. No one knows the mind of God except the Spirit of God. So if somebody knows where that text is, you can find it. Let me know, because I couldn't find it here for some reason. So God knows his mind. And because only God knows his mind, it's like you're walking a path like this. You know, God sees that you need to go this way. But you want to go this way. But you're going to have to walk blind because you don't know where you're going. It says, God's spirit knows his mind. But you don't know God's mind. And so you're going to have to walk even though it doesn't make sense. And I think everybody really struggles with this. It's like, Lord, I'll trust you even though I can't see, just as soon as I can see. <laughs> see? And so learning to walk blind. That, the two examples I think of is you have a hand and a glove. And Yeshua is the hand and I'm the glove. All I can give is give permission for Yeshua to put me on like a hand puts a glove on. And then he acts, and I move with him because he's animating me. The other example is like driving a car, and he's driving the car and I'm in the passenger seat. And I don't know where I'm going, but he does. I can even fall asleep, I'll still get there, you know. Are you driving a Tesla? I hope that he's driving a Tesla with jet engines <laughs> and come out of the back. So when we see police, we can just go up into the sky <laughs> and leave them behind. I've thought of that ever since childhood. Like, man, I wish I had a car. You know, I want to give a ride, you know, to a girl that I know and impress her. Is like, just watch. We're doing about 60. When I hit this button, something's going to happen. She's really going to enjoy. You know, I'm going to slow it to 180 and lift up off the highway and go up into the clouds and do corkscrews. You know, maybe like that's the kind of car. I don't want to you know, pull up to my friend's house or to the church each Sabbath, you know. <laughs> Some of them really does something, a combination car, yes. I mean, the text that came to me when we were speaking about yeah. us and only the mind of the Spirit, yes, yes. only the Spirit knowing the mind of God yeah, is yeah. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Okay. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Most High. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. You just gave me a bridge to something else I wanted to express. See, look at this arrow. See, this arrow is going from right to left. This is going from left to right. And notice this arrow is on top. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. The way the brain is built is first relationship, then knowledge. But man's way is first knowledge, then relationship. You look at how society is built, you know, how we go to school, how the Christian religion runs, you know, how the company works, all of it is built left brain to right brain, which is backwards. It runs against how everybody is designed. And so you have information first, and then action. But we're designed to have action first, then information. When you're raising a child, and the child is one year old, they have a relationship, they smile at you, they feel your love. How much can you teach them about life? Nothing yet. <laughs> exactly. First they have the relationship, because they're a baby, yeah. and then they have the knowledge after that. And so, God says, my ways are higher than, are higher than your ways. Mm. And so when you realize that, you realize, in my relationship with God, I should do the same thing. First, the relationship, first the joy, listen to a song that I love, you know, call a friend who I miss, and it gets me into that relational mode. And then, if I want to study didactic things in the Bible, my mind is just flooding, you know. Mm -hmm. It happens to me a lot of the time, but I didn't know what's the thing that
that I need to keep emotional energy? You know, do I need to just think more? Do I need you know, to relax and play ping pong or do something else you know, to get me in more of a relational mode? So now we can move on to the picker itself. The picker is basically this arrow here, using your left brain to run your right brain, trying to manage your relationships with logic which does not work and which causes any relationship that you have frustration. Like suppose that you really want to go to the store and you're not sure why, but your subconscious knows. And then you talk to your friend or your spouse and you're saying, well, I want to go to the store and get this. And it was like, oh, we already have that here. We don't have to go to the store. But for some reason you feel the sense of disappointment because you didn't just want to go to the store in order to get the food you needed but you also wanted to go to the store because you like the store. And something about its vibe puts you into a certain state of mind that your subconscious knows is going to give you energy for the next task you have to do, you know. Because with me, when I'm around people, I get a lift. Anybody, strangers or friends. So I go to the store and I find, oh, here's some people that I enjoy being with. And then I go home and I bought some things I like that I didn't know were there. And then I'm all happy and then I can do my taxes, you know, because I filled my <laughs> cup of joy, you know. That's full. So you need to ask God to help you in the places you don't want to go. You know, you know, help me, you know, with fixing this appliance that seems to defeat my best efforts at this computer that keeps crashing. Or my taxes, you know. And some people have to deal with two barriers at once. I have to do the taxes, which I hate, and I have to deal with my dislike of the government, which puts cortisol into my brain and body, right. which actually kills brain cells. <laughs> For our own health, it is essential not to hate anything or anyone. This is something the Eastern religions know, but not every Christian knows. Even if the person is in the wrong, if you don't hate them, your life is extended. You get healthier. And this is something I've sought to practice more intentionally recently, you know, is to say, I'm going to forgive which means I won't hold them responsible for what they did, nor will I seek to, even in my mind, imagine them being hurt anymore. And when I do that, you know, I come to freedom. Because God says, you know, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he also says, you know, you should heap coals of fire on your enemy. Well, those coals of fire, I forget what the original word is, but it's referring to kindness. So if you give kindness to that person, you may change their heart. While we were yet enemies, Christ loved us. He did that to us. He puts coals of fire onto us. And that's also something that you see with the experience of the end, this experience of hell. I think it's the same word, those coals of fire. <coughs> the kindness comes your way, but it's so painful if you've resisted God's love. The most painful thing is to be in the presence of absolute love while you're resisting it. True. It's absolutely intense, because it says, who can dwell with everlasting burnings? Those who have pure mind and a clean heart. So everlasting burnings sounds like hell, and then it says the righteous people are going to be there, and they're going to enjoy it. That's great. Which makes me think that those two places are the same place, but the response to God's presence is different. The people who are in sync with love and kindness, even if their left brain didn't know who God was, they're going to say, I like love. This is awesome. I'm enjoying this. So they're going to enjoy God's presence. It isn't like he gives people two different things. He gives them the same thing. But some people love the experience and some don't. Because when you're in the presence of love and you've resisted it, you know, it's very painful. So this picker is what affects everything in our lives. And God wants to say, and I want to run your life from your right brain because he says, I'll give you a new mind, a new spirit, what I put within you. So you can actually do what you want and have it be the right thing. You don't have to try and save yourself by trying to push yourself to do what you need to do. Even though you don't like it, you can say, God, I rest in that new heart. I give you control of my being so that what I want and what you want can progressively become more and more similar, you know. Because I've experienced when I tried to follow my left brain here and do what I thought I should do, I almost went crazy. I remember when I was in Hawaii the first time, I tested this. 
and I took it to the edge of insanity because I like to test an idea before I share it with people to make sure that it works. And I had given up control of myself to God. I called it automatic living. I thought, man, this is so wonderful and so easy. I was making friends at the school. I was teaching English to grade six and PE to grades K through eight. And things went fine for about two weeks. But this left brain is always working. And because it's opposed to God's law, does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so, 